Hello everyone! In this Unity tutorial, we're going to discover how to make a cross-platform wireframe shader. By the end of the video, we'll have a simple shader that allows us to render most geometries as wireframes with various colors, transparency effects, and other options. So we'll be able to see all the edges and the triangles of our objects at runtime, and customize this wireframe visual with a few options. As usual, don't forget that you can find all the code and the assets of this tutorial in my GitHub Unity repo over here. And with that said, let's dive in and see how to create this cross-platform wireframe shader. Before we get into the actual implementation stuff, let's first take a second to discuss why wireframe shaders aren't that easy to do, and why making a cross-platform version requires some brainstorming. Now, in this tutorial, I'm not going to go in details about what shaders are, and I'll assume that you already know the basics about the vertex and the fragment stages of a shader. And in particular, that you know something crucial about basic shaders, which is that in a simple vertex and fragment shader, you don't have any info about your mesh's topology. Indeed, in most shaders, you have this vertex function at the vertex stage that knows things about each vertex on its own. But this function has absolutely no idea how those vertices are connected to each other in the mesh, what the actual shape of your object is. This vertex-to-vertex -vertex connectivity is what we call the mesh topology, and it's what allows us to make faces and get a solid-like object in our Unity 3D scene and game views. The problem is that wireframe shaders aim at rendering this mesh topology, so, by definition, they actually need it, because we want to show the edges in our mesh. So, how can we get this missing data? Well, in Unity, there are two quick tricks to solving the issue and doing wireframes. If you want to render your entire scene in wireframe, meaning that every object in it will be rendered as a wireframe, then you can use Unity's GL graphics and enable the wireframe mode before the scene is rendered. This can be done with this short script. If you put the c -sharp mono behavior class on the camera object in your scene, then it will render the scene with wireframe objects, because the wireframe mode is enabled in the onPreRender hook, so before the render starts. But of course, this doesn't let you discriminate between objects in your scene, so you don't have a lot of control. Turning the wireframe mode off in the onPostRender hook is a way of dodging this issue. Basically, if you put your wireframe objects on one layer, and the other non-wireframe objects of the scene on another, then you'll be able to stack two cameras in your scene that each render only one of the layers, and put the script on just the camera that is rendering the wireframe layer. So this way, you'll render only some of the objects, the ones that are on the wireframe layer, with this special effect. But that still adds quite the complexity to the scene, and you don't have a lot of options to tweak your wireframes, change the thickness, set the color, and so on. Plus, from what I've seen, this actually only works with the old legacy render pipeline, so you can't use it with the new URP or HDRP. That's why oftentimes, to render wireframes, you rather use what's called a geometry shader. In short, the idea of a geometry shader is that, in addition to having the usual vertex and fragment stages, it also has one geometry stage just before rasterization. In other words, you add one new function after the vertex stage, that still works with 3D data, and that, this time, has access to the mesh topology. This means that inside this geometry function of your shader code, you can get info on the triangles and the edges of your mesh, and so you can put together some logic to render a wireframe. Except that geometry shaders actually pose quite a big problem. They only work on some platforms. Basically, some GPUs aren't able to understand this geometry stage notion, and so if you try to run a shader with a geometry stage on incompatible machines, the whole thing will just crash, and in Unity you'll get the magnificent pink error color. And if you think that it's okay because it must be an edge case, think again. All macOS, iOS, and OpenGL ES devices are cursed with this issue, so you can't do any cross-platform desktop or mobile games with geometry shaders. Luckily, there's a possible solution to this conundrum, 
and it's not that widely discussed on the internet from what I've seen. So I've decided to do this little tutorial where we make a cross-platform wireframe shader. And now that we know why it's not that common, let's see how we can achieve this. Now we've said that the problem is with getting our mesh topology on the GPU using a geometry stage. So what if instead of trying to get this topology on the GPU, we pre-computed our geometry data on the CPU? Of course, it's a bit less efficient, but at least all devices should be able to run that. Okay, that's great, but it does raise a question. What exactly is this geometry data that we need to pre-compute? And how can we do this pre-computation and then pass it on to our shader so that we can actually use it in the final fragment stage, as if we'd had a geometry stage in our shader code? Well, we know that rendering a wireframe is about drawing the edges of our mesh at runtime. So in a nutshell, we need a way to tell for every point on the surface of our mesh whether it's on an edge or not. Of course, our wireframe will have a customizable thickness so we won't check if a point is exactly on the edge. Rather, we'll check whether it's close enough by using a threshold. But then, how can we know if our point is beneath this threshold? How can we get its distance to the edges of the triangle that contains it? The trick is to use what we call barycentric coordinates. Basically, the idea is to use local normalized coordinates with three components using the three vertices of the triangle as reference. Each triangle vertex has one component at 1 and the rest at 0, and the rest of the points in the triangle have interpolated barycentric coordinates. So it's a bit like defining a new coordinate system, where the axes are defined by the triangle vertices, and they go through the middle of the opposite edge. With this new system, it's fairly easy to know if a point is near an edge or not, since we just have to look at its three barycentric components, take the smallest one, which corresponds to its distance to the closest triangle edge, and check whether it's beneath our threshold. Okay, that's cool, but the next step is to figure out how to actually define those barycentric coordinates for our mesh. The nice thing is that, as usual, we only need to deal with the actual vertices of our mesh that have the extreme barycentric coordinates, and the rest will be filled in automatically by the computer thanks to interpolation. But still, how can we assign the right barycentric coordinates to each of our mesh's vertices in order to get triangles with these three extreme points that create separate barycentric axes? An interesting solution to this problem is graph coloring. Suppose that instead of considering those three components like numbers in a 3D vector, we look at them like R, G and B components in a color. Then you see that one triangle vertex is red, another is green, and the last one is blue. And then the points in between have colors that are blends of those three pure colors. So if we could assign red, green, and blue colors to all the vertices in our mesh, so that every triangle has those three colors without repetition, we would basically have stored all barycentric coordinates inside our mesh data. This can be seen as a graph coloring problem. We have vertices, linked by edges, and we want to give each vertex a color that is different from the one of its connected neighbors. And then, by looking at the barycentric coordinate value, we can get the distance of each point to the closest edge of its triangle, and we'll be able to get our wireframe. And since we'll pre-compute this data on the CPU in a C-sharp script, this should work on any device. Now, it's essential to note that although it's cross-platform, this method can still fail on some objects. It doesn't work for all meshes. Because we're using barycentric coordinates, we need to use three, and only three colors, to color our mesh vertices. This means that our mesh has to be a graph that is two or three colorable. And this is sadly not true for any mesh. There are some complex meshes that require at least four colors to be graphed colored. However, it's still valid in many cases, and so a wireframe shader will still be applicable to quite a lot of meshes. In order to implement all of this, the idea is quite straightforward. First, we'll make a new C-sharp script in our project, for example one called Mesh Wireframe Computer, and we'll put this script on some primitive objects just to see how it works with some basic shapes. <laughs> 
Then inside the script, we'll add a function called updateMesh. I'll give it a context menu attribute so that we can call it directly from the editor, outside of runtime, and get our mesh data ready immediately so that we can work with it in our shaders. I'll also say that when we're in the editor, we automatically call this function whenever the object is updated, which can be done easily thanks to the onValidate hook. So our updateMesh function will start by checking that our object is indeed active and has a mesh renderer enabled. Then the function will get a reference to the mesh object inside the mesh filter component of the object and apply the graph coloring logic we discussed on it to get per vertex colors. And finally, it will assign those colors as actual vertex colors in the mesh using the mesh.setColors method. No, I'm not going to talk about the details of the graph coloring logic implementation here. There are various possible algorithms such as Welsh Powell's or Shaitan's, or even a more basic process based on the order of the vertices, like the one described in this article by David Gavelin. I've actually used the latter in my demo, and if you're curious, you can either pause the video here to check out the code, or go and have a look at the GitHub repo to see the entire script and copy it into your own project. The link is in the description. Okay, so at this point, if we recompile the script and go back to our scene, it auto-computes the vertex colors to get the barycentric coordinates of our different objects with the script. If you want to make sure that the vertex coloring is up to date for a specific mesh, you can force a refresh by selecting the object and going to the script component context menu in the top right corner and clicking the update mesh custom item that we added thanks to the context menu attribute. Okay, that's probably very cool, but for now we can't really see anything, so we're not sure it's actually worked. To wrap up this initialization part, Let's create our shader and do a simple debug of our vertex colors. We'll right-click in our project doc and then go to the shader graph, URP, and the shader graph menu to create a new shader graph asset. For now, this shader doesn't do anything, apart from applying a gray color to all the pixels matching our object on the screen. To check our vertex coloring worked, let's add a new node in our graph, aptly named vertex color, and plug it into the base color output. If we save our asset and let it recompile, we see that our meshes now have pure colors at each vertex and blended colors everywhere in between. And even better, you see that, in most cases, no two connected vertices have the same color, so it looks like our graph coloring implementation is fine and that we indeed managed to pre-compute our mesh topology. Now if we zoom in, we do see that for the sphere and the capsule, it's a bit shaky. So clearly, for those meshes that are a bit more complex, our graph coloring logic isn't perfect. But you'll see in the next section that it still actually works overall. So now it's time to use this geometry data to actually make a wireframe effect. Okay, we're now all set for creating a wireframe. We know that all we have to do is check the value of our point's barycentric coordinate that is stored as a vertex color, and if it's below a specific threshold, add it to the wireframe. Or else, simply ignore it. So we'll define the threshold as a new float parameter in our shader graph called the wireframe thickness, and set its default value to 1. Then we'll do what we said before, and we'll compute the minimum component of our vector and use a step node to check if it's below the given threshold. Except that if we put this in our base color output and save, we see our meshes get entirely white. That's because, as is, this threshold computation is far from perfect. In order to distinguish the edges, we would need to lower the thickness a lot, and even then, we get some bugs with triangles entirely white, and totally uneven thicknesses from one object to the other. The problem is that, in this logic, we basically use the same thickness for all triangles, even though they clearly don't all have the same size, and so we're comparing changing values to one fixed threshold. To solve this, a good solution is to not take the color value itself, but rather its rate of change along the x and y directions on the screen. We can do this thanks to the ddx and ddy nodes, and because we don't care about the direction of the change, let's path both through absolute nodes to get their absolute value, and then add the two numbers. 
If we multiply our wireframe thickness parameter by this final result and plug it in our computation, then we see that the wireframe disappears. That's because our thickness value is way too low now. So if we bring it back up to 1, we see the wireframe comes back and it now has a constant thickness on our various objects. To finish up this shader, we can add a few extras, such as some color parameters and a lerp node to let the users pick the color of the wireframe and the faces of the mesh in between the wireframe lines, or a boolean parameter to decide whether or not to show these faces. Because if we go to the graph settings and scroll down to enable the alpha clip option, we see that by plugging our wireframe in the alpha slot, we get a mesh where only the wireframe is visible. What's cool is that since it's alpha clipping, we can keep our shader opaque and just discard the pixels we don't want to see, without having any complex transparency computation, which makes the shader far more efficient. And now we could add a branch node to say that if our keep base mesh option is enabled, then the opacity is one everywhere, or else the opacity is given by the wireframe. This way, by toggling our parameter on and off, we can show or hide the faces of our mesh and better customize our wireframe render. Of course, this is just a basic cross-platform wireframe shader example, and it may not work with our meshes, because our graph coloring method is not foolproof. For example, as we said before, the sphere and the capsule have a few missing edges. But still, overall, it gets the job done, and it should work no matter the device. You could obviously add even more options, like rendering both sides of your mesh and having a second wireframe color to still distinguish the overall shape of your object, adding some glow for creating cyber-like effects, or even applying this to the construction of a little building to tell the player where it's at in its construction. But that being said, I think that's already quite enough for today. So I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and that you learned a few things to making a cross-platform wireframe shader in Unity using a bit of C-sharp. If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, if you have other ideas of Unity tricks that you'd like to learn, don't hesitate to leave a comment. As always, thanks for watching and take care.